Well, how's everybody doing today? I hope you guys are having a, a great start to your day. I don't know when you're going to watch this. So maybe you've had a been up for quite a while, or if you're watching this the next day. But um, it is the 14th when I'm recording this, and uh, uh, that'll be Tuesday. So I do want you to do for your assignment, kind of like we've done the last couple times, something that happened on this day in history, the 14th of April and a one famous person who was born on this day in history, the 14th of April. And I'm gonna get started because we actually have a lot to cover today. Uh, we do have a test on Thursday, um, <clears throat> the 16th, uh, and I'll be going over details for that in the Zoom meeting on the 15th. Um, so take good notes, definitely make sure you answer the questions that go along with this video, they can help you on the test. Uh, and we've got a lot to cover, like I said, so we'll get, get going pretty quick here. So as you come out of the Civil War, uh, the Indians once again need to rebuild. Um, their deals with the US government were nullified because they had joined the Confederacy. So they had to make new deals with the US government. Uh, and like before, the US government didn't always deliver on their, uh, their plans and didn't always deliver on the things that they said they would do, uh, oftentimes because they didn't allocate enough money to do that. Uh, but still, uh, the, the Indians once again had to renew uh, deals with the United States government. So we're going to take a very brief look at the five civilized tribes, very, very brief, uh, at what they did. Um, the Seminole went through a, a group of different chiefs, but eventually they elected a chief, John F. Brown, um, who was able to organize the Seminole better. Uh, they created a new national council. 14 bands of towns with two bands of black towns as well. Um, they chose a new capital, uh, Wewoka, uh, and built a council house there. Under Brown's leadership, the Seminole began to enjoy peace and prosperity, uh, something that you know they had solely lacked almost their entire time in Indian territory because of their circumstances when they were removed. She began to see the Seminole uh, thrive, finally. Uh, as you got into like the late 1860s into the early 1870s. The Chickasaw uh, re renewed their call for schools. They also had a large number of orphans to take care of as well. Uh, by 1869, they had developed 12 neighborhood schools uh, and other Chickasaw academies were repaired and reopened. Uh, they added a boarding school in 1876. So uh, orphans also were cared for at an institute as well. Uh, they brought in full-time teachers. And uh, if you want some details, they were under kind of underpaid, kind of like teachers mostly are today. Um, the classes would be taught in English. You definitely would study spelling, reading, arithmetic, which would be math and English as your subjects. Other subject taughts depended on the specialty of that teacher, but some teachers might teach things like grammar, geography, history, physiology to some of these students. More advanced students, however, would have to go to other states to receive a more advanced education. Uh, really a Chickasaw philosophy towards education can be summed up by what a uh, citizen of the Choctaw Nation said, said, quote, we must educate or we must perish. Okay, so they began to see the importance of their education of their children and their survival as a tribe. The Choctaw, uh, also did similar things, opening tribal schools were opened, churches were reopened after the Civil War. They began trying to understand how America was going to modernize, so they developed uh, a new type of society for them. They felt westward expansion was inevitable, so instead of working against it, they should prepare for it uh, and try to create a society that could take more advantage of some of the more industrial, modernized world. Um, the tribe continued to own all the land, but people owned the improvements on the land. That means like if you built a house or fences or walls um, or barns, those were owned by the people, but the land they were on were owned by the tribes. It does mean uh, that individuals could sell houses, could sell improvements that were on the lands, but they could not sell the land itself. Uh, this would be something that they would have in common with a lot of the other tribes as well. Uh, the Choctaw was really also broke into two parts of their society, and in some ways, three parts. It would be similar to the Cherokee. Uh, 
which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But you had full bloods, people who were pure blood uh, Indians. Uh, they were uh, typically farmers and cattlemen. Uh, there were white people who would live amongst the Choctaw. They had to have special permission to do that, but they were tenant farmers uh, who would clear land and plant crops uh, for the chair for the sorry the Choctaw that they were working for and they would oftentimes receive crops as their payments and then there were mixed blood Cherokees I mean, sorry mixed blood Choctaw uh, who lived in towns they often owned trading posts or were involved with the coal timber or stone quarry business we then move on to the creek uh, the creek continued to have uh, some pretty significant divisions amongst the upper and lower creeks, partly because the upper creeks were the ones who primarily fought the Civil War and the lower creeks tried to stay out of it more. Uh, so there was a constant division there, even coming out. They, they had different opinions on how they should deal with the federal government. Um, eventually, there were two different things, the Sands Rebellion, 1871, uh, and the Green Peach War. Now, the, when you say peach, Green Peach War, it was not like some massive war like you could think of. But still, these were both things that had to be dealt with by light horsemen and federal agents had to defuse these situations. Uh, eventually, the Creek were able to come together and once again establish schools uh, and an orphan's home. Uh, some, even one was uh, primarily for African American or Blacks who were part of the Creek tribe. For the Cherokee, one of the major things that happened was John Ross did die in 1866 just a few weeks after signing a new treaty with the U.S. government. Uh, William Ross was elected to fill uh, his uninspired term, which was John Ross's nephew. Um, so they began to open their, well, renew and put their efforts towards the concern of white settlement uh, and the fact that they felt like whites would eventually be coming into the society. Uh, and they really had a three-class society, which was similar to the Choctaws. The full bloods generally had small farms and were poorer than the mixed bloods, but they had a third class of people, which included white laborers who had permits to work in the nation. Uh, so they began to welcome whites a little bit more. Now, whites couldn't just come in and do whatever they wanted. They had to get a permit to work here in this area. And that would be uh, for Indian territory, for quite some time still, whites were not really allowed to be in the territory unless the tribes gave them their permission. Once again, their public school system uh, was the envy of uh, other tribes. Uh, they had seminaries, uh, which were residential schools, an orphan asylum, uh, high school for blacks, uh, 100 primary schools. On average, about 4,000 students attended school for the Cherokee during this time period. Um, they also began to prosper again uh, and were able to make a lot of money off leasing grasslands, which brought revenue from cattlemen, uh, which we'll be talking about cattle drives here in just a moment. Well, one of the issues becomes how do the tribes treat freedmen or former slaves who are now free living in Indian territory? Well, the two tribes that considered freedmen as equals were the Creek and the Seminole tribe. So there was no segregation there. Uh, everything was smooth uh, and the Blacks were seen as equals and could achieve equal status in those tribes. The other three tribes, uh, I'm not going to say from the top down, but there was some disagreement over what should be done with the Black Americans who were here. So to some extent, uh, all the other tribes in Indian Territory did practice segregation, much like some of the southern states after the Civil War, which continues all the way into the 1950s and 60s, you continue to see segregation. Um, there was the development of some all-Black settlements, which provided some uh, safety and some freedom from uh, some of these areas. So we'll be talking about that a little bit more in the next chapter, though, some of the Black settlements that were established a little bit later. But segregation, unfortunately, becomes a part not only of American history, but of Oklahoma history during this time period of separating out differences between Blacks and non-Blacks. We also had the development of government schools for Plains Indians. So we mostly here have been talking about the five tribes, obviously. But for Plains Indians, you begin to see the development of uh, schools for them run by the federal government. 
the first of those, and really this is the oldest federal government school for Indians because it still exists today, was the Riverside Indian School uh, in Anadarko. Um, it also has been known as the Wichita Caddo School. Uh, but like I said, this is the one that has existed for the longest. Uh, you also have the development of the Chiloco Indian School uh, in 1884. This was also to educate Plains Indians tribes children. It was a boarding school, meaning that the children had to come and live at the school. And when it was first used, man, those students were pretty scared to go here, uh, something they had never experienced in their lives. Students studied uh, academic subjects the first half of the day. Uh, and then they studied agriculture for the boys and the girls domestic jobs in the afternoon part of the day. Uh, the school eventually did accept Indian children from anybody in the territory, not just Plains Indians tribes. Uh, by 1907, it had grown to 35 buildings. From 1930 to 1959, the enrollment ranged from 800 to 1200 students here. It did close in 1980. Uh, the intention of this school was to educate the children in, you know, the American way of life, the more white way of life, help them develop into someone who assimilated into that. But interestingly, by the time the school closed, its intentions were never realized because it really uh, reinforced tribal identities instead uh, of creating these kids who kind of became more of the greater size of society. They instead stayed kind of uh, isolated and uh, part of their tribe and did not really assimilate into uh, American society around them. Missionaries also continued to work with schools and organized churches, uh, a whole bunch of different denominations were involved in this process. Well, let's move away from the five tribes, although they'll be mentioned a little bit here. But you can begin rebuilding the economy of the area of Indian Territory, and a big part of that, and one of the very unique parts of Oklahoma history, uh, and I enjoy talking about this one, is the cattle drives that took part through this state. Uh, now first off, this is something I think uh, maybe you've experienced by seeing it in a movie or something. Uh, if you've ever watched a Western, they oftentimes have cattle drives or something. And I think we see a romanticized version. It definitely would not be an easy life to live to do a cattle drive. Uh, it'd be a pretty difficult uh, livelihood. Um, it could be a profitable one if you um, did it though. Um, also, cattle drives are something that exists only for about a 20-year period, and of that 20-year period, only about 10 years where it was used a great deal. So it's a small part of American history and the history primarily of three states, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, tends to be where you see these cattle drives take place. Um, and the big thing was the railheads, which was where the rail lines end, um, played a big part in this. So you didn't have really a developed rail lines going into Texas, uh, and there was definitely not any rail lines into uh, what we would call Oklahoma today. So you had rail lines that, uh, you know, go to Kansas City or Abilene, uh, and that's where you would see uh, these cattle drives go. They would take their cattle from Texas, drive them all across by on horseback uh, through Texas through Oklahoma into Kansas, sometimes all the way to, you know, for the further northern parts of Kansas. Uh, and why would they do this? This was to make profit. So uh, cattle were, you know, super cheap. If you were buying them in Texas, you could literally buy a cattle, a, a cow, imagine this, for $2 <laughs> uh, in Texas. But it could bring $40 if you sold it elsewhere. That's 20 times the profit. So it made a lot of sense to take this time and effort to drive the cattle north, get them on the rail lines, and ship them out east where you could sell them for a lot more money. Okay, so you did cattle drives and you had to drive them from Texas to Kansas because it was worth the profit and you had to get them to the rail line. Uh, there's going to be future developments that will lead to the end of this, and we'll talk about those here in a little bit. Uh, but for this time period, uh, this was a method you needed to use in order to make the maximum profit off your cattle. Uh, and Texas was known for its cattle, and still is somewhat to this day, but we're especially known for their cattle and their longhorn cattle during this time period. Well, as these cattle would cross the territory, uh, they would have to go on 
some trails and we'll talk about some specific trails coming up but just in general what was the travel like now i put 15 miles a day here uh, on a really good day you actually could maybe make 25 miles but most days were actually more of the 15 mile variety that you would drive the cattle on a day first off uh you know on horseback you can definitely go further than this if you were just riding a horse by yourself uh, but the cattle one can't go as fast as the horses cattle get tired and the cattle need time to graze because if you work the cattle too hard uh, on the travel up to kansas one the cattle might die two by the time they get to kansas if they did make it and you didn't and you traveled too fast the cattle would be skinny and they wouldn't be worth much so you kind of need to to stop give the cattle time to eat uh, fatten up stay stay you know pretty healthy uh, so that was a big part of them not traveling too fast uh, on the cattle drives uh, we are going to talk about different positions but uh, one of those being the drover who was the trail driver they were the head uh, driver and responsible for getting the herd of cattle to the market oftentimes most herds consisted of 2,500 to 3,000 cattle uh, there was a whole bunch of other people involved uh, in a wide range. I'm going to go through a little bit of their positions, but also besides their positions, um, <clears throat> you had Blacks, Hispanics, Indian men, along with whites, obviously, who were part of these cattle drives. Occasionally, even a, a woman slipped in disguised as a man uh, to join in the cattle drive. Uh, you have some people, you know, in their... 13, 14 year olds doing these cattle drives. Uh, that doesn't mean the average person was 13 or 14, but you'd have some very young people going on these cattle drives as well. Uh, as far as like the, the form, you would have a point man who would be the one leading the herd uh, out front. Then you would have multiple swing riders on the side. Uh, the swing rider and the flank rider are similar, but the swing rider is more towards the front. They're about a third of the way back for the herd and their job would be to get any stragglers and they'd be on both sides. There'd be a, a person doing this on both sides, any stragglers, any cattle who would get off and, and go off, they'd have to kind of round them up, get them back to the herd. Flank riders were in about two thirds of the way back from the front and they would have the same job as the swing riders, but they'd be dealing more with those in the back third. Um, and then you had drag riders. This would probably be the worst job and the job that they would give to the rookies, uh, the newbies uh, on the cattle drive. The reason this was such a terrible um, job to have was you would be behind the herd. And if it was dry weather, there would be dust just coming in your face all day long. Um, but you also, you know, besides that, you're coming, you're bringing up the rear of the herd, making sure that nobody in the herd goes too slow or, or gets left behind. Um, there also were other positions, the wrangler, who often worked in conjunction with the cook. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the cook in a minute. But the wrangler was responsible for taking care of uh, the wagon, making sure the horses were fed and doctored, because as well as bringing all of these cowboys, uh, there would be a lot of horses per cowboy, uh, sometimes as many as eight horses. Uh, so he would be helping keep the other horses fresh, keep the other horses fed. Um, also helping take care of the wagon, helping the cook get firewood, uh, unhook the team, help drive the wagons uh, because they would have a wagon of supplies. The cook would have his chuck wagon, which we'll talk about in a minute. Like I said, the work days were long. You often would work from sun up to sundown. Uh, I mean, you'd get up before the sun was up, eat a quick breakfast, uh, oftentimes consisting of bacon uh, for sure, and you know, possibly some biscuits. On a good trip, you might get eggs for a little while, but you're going to run out of eggs. But bacon and biscuits, uh, dried meats would be a lot of what you would get. Uh, your evening meals, you would get other types of things as well. These journeys tended to be one to three months, depending on how well the journey went, what time of year, what was the weather like, those types of things. Um, chuck wagon was something that was nated, named by a man. Uh, well, it was named after a cattleman named Charles Goodnight. Uh, it was a wagon where you could pull down and you could basically have a cook's table, uh, something called the chuck box. Um, eventually, even the name chuck became a slang word for food. Um, the cook had to get up really early, start at like 3 a.m. 
making biscuits, give them time to rise. Uh, they could also, they also ate besides eating a lot of bacon, like I said, and biscuits, they also would eat a lot of beans, stew. Occasionally they get some beef, uh, pie for dessert, always had black coffee um, ready in the morning and ready other during meals. Uh, it also serves the headquarters uh, where people would gather to eat, listen to music, talk, even sleep. Uh, the cook not only made the meals, he also acted as the barber, the doctor, the banker, and the arbiter. I don't know about you, uh, but I would not want like Gordon Ramsay as my doctor. Uh, but I guess in this case, you did what you had to do. Uh, the cook was kind of a, uh, did a lot of multiple jobs. Cook oftentimes too, once they cooked breakfast and they got everything packed back up, they would then try to ride ahead of the herd uh, to check for any problems that might be happening. So they also were a part of the drive and making sure that the drive was safe. Now, as you're going to drive cattle, you need to develop some cattle trails. Um, and there's more than these two that I've mentioned here. Uh, but I wanted to mention a couple here. Um, because I, I want you to, to see the development and talk about some of the more important ones. The reason I bring up the East Shawnee Trail is it was the first established cattle trail in an Indian territory. Um, it goes uh, through the eastern part of the state. Uh, it is not going to in the long run be the preferred way to go, but it is something that uh, they use early on. You also had um, the importance of particular towns in Kansas. Abilene, Kansas eventually became known as the cow capital of the world. Uh, so your goal became to drive your cattle to Abilene. Initially, it was kind of Kansas City, but as the railroad extended out to Abilene, this became the cow capital of the world. Uh, Hundreds of thousands of cattle would be driven here every year to get on rail lines to be shipped out east. Uh, eventually, um, a man named Jesse Chisholm developed a new trail. Uh, he was a Scottish Cherokee. This trail followed much of present day Highway 81 through Oklahoma. In 1867, the first year the Chisholm Trail was used, about 35,000 head of cattle were driven on this trail. By 1871, about 600,000 cattle were herded on this trail. It became the most popular trail and the most used trail. Uh, sadly, we were going to go to a, muse a, a museum uh, and talk about the Chisholm Trail on the trip, uh, which is, is a pretty fun stop. But these became the preferred trails. And the reason you would want to follow a trail is someone had gone on these trails before. This meant that they probably had figured out where to do water crossings, which were very difficult. Uh, if you have a herd of cattle and you got to get across a creek or a river, you need to do it at a particular place. And these trails would often guide you to the better places. You also need water, period. You certainly couldn't store enough water for your whole trip. So you had to come by water sources in order to have water for yourselves. And you also had to have water, obviously, for your cattle and for your horses. So you couldn't just go off wherever you wanted because if you didn't know the land and you got to places where there weren't water, you may lose your whole herd and your whole cattle driving team. Um, also, you wanted to go through areas that weren't heavily wooded uh, and didn't, weren't, didn't have big forests. Okay, so these trails oftentimes would guide you to water sources around those other things. Now, if you go during a particular dry part of the year in a drought or something, then it might be hard to find water. You might go on a cattle drive and you have the opposite problem where you're bogged down in mud the whole time because you're getting a lot of rain. So uh, definitely the, tra the trail was never the same for anybody because uh, the weather would play a huge role uh, in what would go on. Uh, lightning and thunderstorms would scare cattle. And sometimes if those happen at night, the cattle would scatter and you'd have to go gather them all the next day to get them together. So it was a very difficult job. Uh, definitely a lot of hard, hard work. Well. What eventually brought um, the Chisholm Trail was used a lot too because it was the most direct route from Texas to Abilene. Uh, it kind of went through the middle of the state uh, and just became the, the most direct route and the best route as far as all the other criteria uh, for cattle trails. Um, now, why did cattle drives drive die out? You know, why didn't they continue to do this? Why don't we still see cattle drives? Obviously, we, we don't have horses anymore. It, you probably can get why it ends, but what happens that makes this end? Uh, 
One, you have the development of barbed wire, which may sound like not that big a deal, but barbed wire is actually one of the most ingenious inventions uh, in Western history, at least. Um, before this, you couldn't really, you couldn't afford to build some nice fence to keep all of your livestock in, but barbed wire was a cheap way to do that. As far as cattle drives, what this does is makes it harder to travel the territory if you keep coming up on fences. You have to go around those fences or find a gap in the fence or find a gate in the fence. Um, more and more settlers continued to come, which meant there were more settlements you were going through, which meant, you know, if you were driving through this area, then you were grazing on their land. And this becomes a whole other issue of free grazers, people who would just kind of drive their cattle wherever and might graze off other people's actual property. Um, refrigerated rail cars, also where the meat could be, you could butcher the meat, uh, and then the meat could be kept fresh in a refrigerated rail car. You don't have to have cattle live as they go out west. And really, I saved, I know it says more railroads, but I saved that one for last because that's the big one. Uh, eventually, as the railroad extends down into Indian Territory, down into Texas, you certainly didn't need to drive cattle to Kansas because you could, uh, if the cattle were in Texas, and the rail line goes to Texas, then you could just put the cattle directly on the railroad and oftentimes in a refrigerated rail car uh, directly from Texas. So you no longer had to drive them to the closest railhead in um, Kansas. So that's really why you saw the end of these cattle drives. And like I said, it was only about a 10 to 20 year period where cattle drives played a major role uh, in Western history. Speaking of railroads, uh, obviously we had mentioned in a previous chapter, the goal to build the Transcontinental Railroad. It was completed on May 10th, 1869, and the golden spike that completed the Transcontinental Railroad was laid uh, in Promontory Summit, Utah. <clears throat> this is where they brought the rail lines uh, from the east <clears throat> uh, to the rail lines with the west together. As you see the development of the railroads, you also begin to see the first rail lines make their way into Indian Territory. This isn't on the slide, but it is something you're going to need to answer, so pay close attention. Um, the first railroad track was laid in 1870, and it was a part of the Katy, K-A-T-Y, rail line, uh, and eventually reached the Vertigus River by 1871. So the first railroad to be laid in Indian Territory was known as the Katy Line, Katy Line, K-A-T-Y Line. Uh, but from there, the railroad is going to expand into Indian Territory and become a part of, you know, what we have today. There's the railroad still important today, not as important as it was then, still pretty important today. Um, you did have the first development of coal mining in Oklahoma. We went through this a little bit way towards the beginning of class. There are still some coal mines in Oklahoma, but they are not highly productive coal mines. Uh, they were more productive during this time period, but obviously we don't have a, a, a huge amount of coal in Oklahoma. Uh, all the coal mines, if you remember, were in the eastern part of the state. James J. McAllister uh, started the first coal mining company, just simply known as the Oklahoma Mining Company. Uh, he had become uh, a citizen of both the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations uh, and created this mine here and split the royalties with the Choctaw nation, the money that was being made from this first coal mining company. Now, obviously, coal today is still important because uh, there still are coal power plants being used today. Uh, but coal back then was extremely important. One, that was what trains ran on, obviously. Steam power was run by coal. But also, this is primarily how people would uh, keep their homes warm. So this would be your heat. Uh, now, you could have a wood-burning stove for sure, but coal was much better at burning. It burned hotter and burned longer. So coal was the preferred method of keeping your home warm. So, you know, before the development of electricity and before the development of other types of engines for uh, diesel engines primarily for trains. Coal was extremely, extremely important during this time period. You also begin to have your first uh, development of oil. Now, oil is not going to be used for cars yet. 
those are not invented. They're not going to be used for diesel trains yet. They didn't really invent the diesel engines yet. Uh, during this time period, um, some people like to bathe in oil-coated waters. It was thought to help treat arthritis, uh, rheumatism, health resorts. Now, it wasn't typically just oil that you were bathing in, but oil-coated waters. Um, oil would also, initially, the primary use for oil uh, would be in making kerosene, uh, which would be used to light people's homes. And the first oil company in Oklahoma was organized in 1872. It was the Chickasaw Oil Company. Uh, like I said, the market for oil in the United States was pretty small until the later 1800s. And it's not until the, uh, you know, kerosene is developed and that's gonna have a, something we'll be talking about a lot next year with John D. Rockefeller, uh, that you see oil become a bigger deal. But you do begin to see the beginning of the oil business, which today, obviously, for automobiles uh, and just factories and all kinds of things that use it has become the most important commodity probably on the planet. Well, law and disorder. So let's look a little bit at some of the lawlessness that was existing in Indian Territory during this time period. Uh, some of this was grazing livestock and just cattle drives in general. Uh, so as the cattle drives are going through, they're grazing. Oftentimes they would be raided by certain Indian tribes. Uh, sometimes cattlemen would die in these things. Um, this also becomes a uh, effort by Indian tribes to make money off of grazing livestock. Um, the Cherokee tried to collect the least money from ranchers to graze their cattle on the Cherokee outlet. Uh, and they tried to maybe even do this for cattle drives as much as possible. Some of these tribes did to try to make money off the fact that these cattle were going through their land. Uh, and that land was owned by the tribes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but in general, some of them were able to develop uh, grazing rights for animals who were going to be staying on the land there. Because the land was good for the cattle to grow and become fat. Uh, so they did develop a way to make some money off of that without, you know, selling the land to whites. Uh, part of the maintaining order was the light horse police, which we've talked about multiple times. Every tribe had these. Uh, by this time period, even the, the Plains Indian tribes developed their own light horse as well. Punishments would vary depending on what your crime was. Uh, let's say your first offense for for something would typically include 25 to 50 lashes. Second offense, uh, more severe lashing, a third offense could result in death by firing squad. The Cherokee Nation actually established a gallows or a you know hangman's noose uh, in Tahlequah for executions. Now this next part is very interesting to me, is that someone who would be con condemned to death uh, would then be released by their family to go home uh, and then they were just called to return on execution day. Now, for our society today, that would be probably ridiculous. So imagine, you know, some uh, serial killer, you know, it's like, hey, we're sending you home until you come back for your execution. You're probably not going to see that person again. They're going to go to Mexico or Canada or try to leave the country or leave the state and hide for the rest of their lives. Uh, you know, that probably wouldn't work. However, for the Indians, this worked because if you remember, the worst thing you could be for an Indian tribe was a coward. So if you didn't show up for your death, then you could not take place in the eternal hunting ground of ancestors after you died. Okay, so even if you were put on death row, which is a bad thing, at least if you showed up, that showed you were still brave and you still could maybe enjoy, according to the, the beliefs of the Indians, you could still could enjoy a, um, a pretty good afterlife uh, as long as you showed up and showed your bravery. So. It would work for their society, but it would certainly not work for us. Really, the biggest problem, however, that caused the most problem, trouble in Indian lands was illegal liquor. Uh, continue to say that uh, all liquor was illegal in Indian territory, whiskey being a big part of that. But you also began uh, to see people making their own liquor. Oftentimes, liquor was called fire water. Bootleggers were the people who were making their own liquor, uh, making their own stills. Uh, sometimes this could be extremely dangerous uh, as the people maybe didn't have certain standards and uh, you could have liquor that could actually put you to death. Uh, so the light horse, a lot of what they did was continue to try to get rid of illegal liquor in Indian territory. 
You then also have the rise of time period of outlaws. Uh, different outlaws came into Indian territory to escape uh, from the law. Uh, Jesse James is one of those who came with Cole Younger into Indian territory. Uh, and when he came, he uh, settled and lived in a house briefly with a, a woman named Myra Bell Shirley. Uh, her husband was Sam Starr. She later became known as Bell Starr or the Bandit Queen. Uh, she often would house outlaws and keep them safe from the law. Uh, she and her husband got in a great deal of trouble. Um, she actually never spent much time in jail, but she did face trial for robbery and horse theft. but she was eventually killed. Her sly slayer's identity was never learned, but she was killed in 1889. I guess if you, you hang out with outlaws, eventually it's going to catch up to you. Um, Fort Smith plays a big role in this time period as well, as far as trying to stop a lot of the lawlessness in Indian territory. There was no federal uh, law that existed inside Indian territory as far as uh, a, you know, a, a courthouse or a jail. Uh, so if there was anybody who was guilty of a crime outside of Indian territory who came here to escape, those people had to be found out. Uh, and this often would be done by US deputy marshals who would work in conjunction with Fort Smith and a uh, very famous judge from this time period, Judge Isaac Parker, a uh, former lawyer, judge, and congressman from Missouri, appointed judge in the Western District of Arkansas in 1875. And uh, he not only would deal with, you know, some of the crimes that were going on in Western parts of Arkansas, but he would send in U.S. Deputy Marshals uh, to try to track down any fugitives of the law, any outlaws in Indian territory, and they would be brought to uh, Fort Smith for trial. Now, um, he obviously gains the nickname, the Hanging Judge, which I'll talk about more here in a minute. Just did he hang actually that many people? Uh, but I want to talk about one guy. Uh, that I you know, have a question for, who is Bass Reeves? Uh, and it does talk about him on page 283 in your book, so if you want to look at that, you can. But he was an ex-slave who became a U.S. Marshal, so a black U.S. Marshal. Uh, and there's a really interesting story in your book about him. Uh, he was the first black American west of the Mississippi who became a deputy U.S. Marshal. He did whatever was necessary to apprehend uh, the um, outlaws that he was trying to track down. One story, he disguised, disguised himself as a tramp. He won the trust of the mother of an outlaw. When her outlaw sons returned home to sleep, he handcuffed them while they slept and successfully returned them to Fort Smith. Um, interestingly, he did not, was not able to read, but he had a very good memory and he was learned, he was able to associate the written name with sounds of the name, which allowed him to serve a suspect with the correct document despite not being able to read. So like I said, Judge Isaac Parker got the reputation as the hanging judge. One of the things about Fort Smith is it was not really meant to be a prison. It was a fort uh, and they didn't have a full-time jail. So you, they were kind of kept in the basement of this building or the lower floor. The living conditions were terrible. There were no bathrooms, uh, no showers. Uh, you were just giving like you know a bucket of water a wash basin to wash up uh the bathroom you would literally go to the bathroom in buckets uh those would eventually those would be emptied out every once in a while uh there was not beds you'd kind of sleep on the floor uh you just get a blanket uh so it was terrible conditions on top of the fact that oftentimes there might be a hundred people in this single room together so not really any privacy I wish we could have gone to Fort Smith and, and saw this room. It's a pretty interesting place to see. Uh, but eventually this was brought forth and they made improvements to the conditions for the prisoners here. Uh, like I said, Judge Isaac Parker was known as the hanging judge. Um, interestingly, Isaac Parker was not actually someone who enjoyed giving out the death penalty and giving out hanging as a crime. Uh, as a punishment for a crime, but if he felt like it fit the crime, he oftentimes would do that. In all, Judge Parker tried 12,490 cases, 
of those 9,454 had convictions, so that does mean about 3,000 were found not guilty. Of those, he sentenced 160 men to death by hanging, 160 out of the 9,454 cases. And with that, only 79 were actually uh, put to death through hanging. The other 81 inmates either won their appeals or were pardoned or died in jail. And he was a judge here for over 10 years. So, I mean, he definitely deserves the reputation as the hanging judge, but when we hear that, we might think he put thousands to death, but only 79 met the fate of being hung by the hanging judge. Okay, well, that's where we're going to end this chapter. Um, as we end this chapter, uh, I do want you to answer one more goofy question for me. You know, we've had your favorite color, we've had your favorite movie. So now if you could, if you have one, what is your favorite number? Uh, answer that also as well. Um, what is your favorite number? And I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, and we'll be talking, like I said, on Wednesday about uh, your test. Talk to you guys later.